All right. Now, last week we saw a tradition was broken and a group of people got saved. They got set free. This incredible opportunity where Peter gets told, hey, there's the sheep. No, I'm not going to eat anything unclean. Hey, it's not unclean. If I call it clean, I'll go. And so he goes to, to this Roman's house and the Roman says, hey, come and tell us about Jesus. And he's like, you know, I'm not supposed to go into a Roman's house. I don't go. I don't do Gentile. I'm a Jew. And he's like, you know, what? but God told me to do it. And he does. And the whole spirit of the Lord falls upon him while he tells them the good news of Jesus Christ and the family is baptized in the Holy Spirit and it ends with them going, well, gosh, if they got baptized in the Holy Spirit, who am I to stop them from being baptized in water? And so we looked at the four simple things. If you look overhead, they should be in your notes already. Is number one, God speaks to everybody. Amen? Amen? God speaks to all. He says, I should not call any man unholy or unclean. Number two, do you have a message? He said, hey, we want to hear a message from you. We were challenged, do I have a message? Peter made it very clear that the result of Jesus Christ is either judgment or salvation. That's it. Do we have a message? Are we able in a moment's notice to talk to somebody about what's going on in our world and how to bring it back to Jesus Christ within seconds? Number three, we are to worship God and not people. Worship God and not people. We find it so easy, as I showed you, to worship celebrities and football and everything else because of our time, talent, and treasures. That which we think about most is our God. Okay, let's get real here. Parking is disappearing here. And yet, I know that there is a parking lot right across the street here that's salt that can cost people like um, anywhere between three and six bucks to park to come to church. And so all of a sudden, people start talking about, oh gosh, I don't know if we can do that. But I don't know about you, but I've never been to the stadium without that. I'm hitting me for 10 bucks or more. But I'm willing to do that for a football game, but I'm not willing to do that for Jesus Christ. I'm willing to do that to go to a concert, but I'm not willing to do that for Jesus Christ. I'm just saying. <laughs> and so, really? Do we really want to see this replayed? Our finances in heaven? Do we want to see that tape? Oh, wait, wait, wait. You know, I go to church, they're always asking for money. You ever notice every time you go to Walmart, they're asking for money? <laughs> Do you really want to see that tape in heaven replayed on how we've looked at our finances and how we've handled them? And so we're sitting here looking at this thing here, and he says, I'm going to worship God, not people. And then number four, like Peter, we need to be interrupted, don't we? You know, and every time I go to another country to preach, they always give me an interpreter, and he comes up and he says, hello, my name is, I'm going to be your interpreter. And I said, you mean my interrupter? <laughs> you know, and he always laughs, you know, and it's just like, oh, you're, yeah, you're my interrupter, because I have to stop and then pause, and then he says it, and he looks at me and goes, huh? You know, and all that stuff, because I talk too fast. <laughs> we all need the Holy Spirit to interrupt us sometime, amen? Because God is large and in charge. So... This tradition was broken. However, sadly, unfortunately, tradition is sometimes the hardest beast to die. Some in this very room, you walked into this church for the very first time and you saw me and you said, please, God, tell me that's not the pastor. He doesn't even have pants on. We have traditions of what we were taught, how we were taught, why we were taught, all these things that are in some book somewhere that we've never read. But we swear they're just right there behind the Trinity. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Suit. Whatever it may be. Am I making any sense? And so we learned this, and so we have to recognize that in every generation of church history, remember that's one of the courses that I taught in the seminary is church history. In every generation, there has been a generation that was seen as the rebels in church history. Do you realize, you ready for this bomb dropper, my students always love this one, that at one time the Baptists were the radicals? <laughs> but there are wild, crazy hymns. Yes, and their baptistries, they put things inside the church to put people underwater in. Say it isn't so. 
So much so that Zwingli went out and one time, he says, you want to be baptized? We'll baptize you. And one part of the church drowned 176 people of the other part of Jesus Christ church. So Jesus Christ people killed Jesus Christ people because they couldn't handle the wild psychoticness of these people who wanted to do immersion baptism. That's in our pedigree. We've got some black eyes. Whenever we've taken our focus off of the gospel. He says, you know, the law says I can't go into your house. Whose law? Because it's definitely not in the Bible's law. And that's why chapter 11 is so crazy. What we're going to look at today in chapter 11 is going to blow your mind. And I'll tell you why. Because it's an almost repeat of chapter 10. Now stick with me for a second. We're used to burning up film and burning up time, and especially all of you that have grown up in a digital generation, you take all the pictures you want because you could delete. But when we were given a little Kodak thing that you could only go like this 24 times, <laughs> it was a very precious picture indeed. I'd be surfing with Dano, and I had my little yellow camera, that little thing thing. It was like this big for waves, and he's like, take my picture, and I'm like, why? You suck. And I'm like, wait, you know, I want to get a good shot, you know? It's, it's like, when are we going to take the photo? We, you guys click, 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 click. Can you imagine writing on a scroll when how precious it is to write in a scroll that now the Holy Spirit would take chapter 11 to say exactly what we heard in chapter 10? If they're going to waste that much papyrus... It must mean that God says, I need you to not miss this. That's right. So let's not miss it. Amen? Amen? Okay, let's grab a hold now. We end it here in chapter 10, verse 47, where after Pete sees the miracle, the Holy Spirit falling down, they're speaking in tongues. It's just a Holy Spirit fest. He says, surely no one can refuse water for these who have been baptized, who received the Holy Spirit just as we did. Can he? Apparently, we're going to find out the answer to that. And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days. Now, I mentioned with you last week that was an obvious, wow, of course they'd have him stay on. They have no clue what just happened to them. And so please, someone explain this. But I want to, again, just explain a little bit in church history. Would you notice what came first? Notice the Spirit of God came down before baptism. Did you see that, church? So again, when someone says to you that baptism saves, or someone who is not saved until baptism, then we have a situation here, because when the Holy Spirit comes in with and upon someone, that is the sign of salvation. And so we get baptized because we are saved, not to get saved. Amen? Amen. We do so because God calls me to do so. Repent and be baptized. It's a step of obedience. It says, you're God and I'm not. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And here's where we get that understanding. The Spirit of God fell. Peter says, well, gosh, we've already seen this, so let's get him baptized. So I want you to kind of jot this little progression down in your notes, please, in that little notebook there. Peter sees a vision. He sees a vision. And so when he sees it, guess what? A lesson was learned, a message was given, and people were saved. The vision comes down. God says, whatever I have cleaned, clean, go. So all of a sudden he gets the lesson. Okay, God, I've now learned that you said it's okay to do this. Then a message is given. And then now our people are saved. And who gets saved? A bunch of Italians. Yeah. Hey, a bunch of Italians get saved. A bunch of Torciarellis get saved that night. That's my wife's maiden name, Torciarelli. One of the guys in my elders of my church in Santa Barbara, best Italian name of all time, Antonio Giuseppe Natale. I just love saying his name all the time. I felt like I was in a restaurant. I'll have the Antonio Giuseppe Natale, please. So a bunch of Italians are walking around with the Holy Spirit, and they're like, what? Because you see, not everybody saw the vision. Not everybody learned what Peter learned. And that is why we pick up now at verse 1 in chapter 11. Now the apostles and the brethren who were in, throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised, what does it say? Took issue. Took issue with him. Now can you put your pencil and put little sad face right there? 
I always tell you to put happy face. This is sad face. Some of your versions will say contended with him. Some might say criticized him. It's like you really want to say, really? Really? Seriously? They come back saying, man, Holy Spirit fell, Italians got saved, a Roman cohort, man, a, a, a general. He, it, it, was, it was amazing. And he comes home, and what does he receive? Criticism. And what I want you to do is underline that word, took issue. They took issue with him. They just completely judged with him right away, and as they're judging him, but that word took issue is the word diacrino. Diacrino. Now, those of you that have been around long enough, does that sound familiar to you? Look at that last half of the word, starting with the K. What is that word? Crino. What did I teach you that word means? Obviously, I am a failure and I'm going to take up sailing instruction. <laughs> Crino. Condemnation. So it's diacrino. They're taking in, they're having a condemnation upon him. You did this. Now they're, hey, can you tell us, hey, we heard it, something, is, is this true or why did you do it? No, it's you did this. Why did you do this? The condemnation has already been formed in the word crino, which is the opposite of kritikos, where we get the word critique. A critique says it's either good or bad, not so-so, needs more garlic, whatever. Diacrino means this is horrible. What you did was wrong. So they took issue, and who did so? It says those who were circumcised. Well, please understand that that did not mean everybody back in the day. They didn't all do it that way back then. Acts 15, verse 5, if you want to just peek a little bit, let me tell you what does it mean to say the circumcised. It described those Christians who still held to the law of Moses. In Acts 15, verse 5, it says, but certain ones of the sects of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying it's necessary to what? Circumcise them and direct them to observe the law of Moses. So they're saying now, oh great, they, they prayed, they received Jesus Christ, but what they need to do next is become circumcised. Now, let's just talk about that for a second. What do we know circumcision stood for? Up until this point in time, who was circumcision for? Jews. So they're saying, it's not that you become a Christian, but you become a, a Jew. Are you tracking with me? So now they're carrying their own earlier understanding and saying, this is what this means to me. Understand this. Galatians 2.12, look overhead. They're talking about this. We addressed it when we were in the book of Galatians about this mindset. And he says this. Thank you very much. He says, Galatians 2.12, for prior to their coming, certain men from James, he, he used to eat with, with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of what? Okay, so there was this group, these Pharisees who had stepped into the context of Christianity, believed that Jesus was who Jesus said that he was, that he was the Messiah, and that he was the Savior, and they did that, which is awesome, but one thing that they forgot to do, or that they couldn't do, is let go of the past. They came in with their own mindset. You see, once again, put this in your notes, we find Christians questioning other Christians whom God has chosen and called. Once again, we have Christians defending themselves amongst Christians instead of preaching Jesus to those who need to hear the gospel. Amen? And this irks me. Oh, it irks me. It irks me. It irks me. I have left so many ecumenical meetings and gatherings disappointed because when I showed up, they were more into, well, who's saying what, and who gets the credit, and why is this going to happen in this direction, and what about this, rather than saying, you know what, instead of talking about what may happen with who gets the cards after an evangelism outreach, instead, why can't we just be saying, how can we present the gospel and let the Holy Spirit do the rest? Are you tracking with me? You ever wondered why we don't have like Harvest Crusades and things here? Do the math. It's because when organizations come, like Billy Graham, and want to do a crusade, then when the churches come together, they're like, well, what we, what we want to know is if we're going to be a part of it, who gets the names of the people get saved? How does this happen? Well, what, 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 who is in charge of this? If we do this, then we want to be able to get this, and so forth. And I'm sitting there going, 
No wonder there's people rioting right now. God, forgive us. But take a little comfort, not a lot, that it's nothing new. Sin stinks. Sin kills. And it killed the joy of what was going on in this church. And what were they upset about? They said, verse 3, you went into the uncircumcised men, and what did you do? Ate with them. Oh! You ate with them! Can I just tell you right now, I'm pretty sure today I ate with somebody uncircumcised. I didn't check, letting you know, but to this day, <laughs> I'm very sure that I was around people who were probably uncircumcised. And um, yeah, I guarantee this whole week, if not today. Okay? Why is this such a big deal? Well, you have to understand, they were not upset that these guys got saved. They weren't even upset that the Holy Spirit came upon them and gave them tongues. What they were upset with was that Peter and the six with him actually shared a meal with these Gentiles because Gentiles in their teaching were considered unclean. And in order to convert, they had no problem with conversion because they had people convert to Judaism all the time. But when you converted to Judaism, the process was that you were circumcised. And so they said, you sat with them before they were clean because they were uncircumcised. Point is, they brought their own brand of flavor of religion, brought it into Christianity and laid it down and placed its limitations upon the gospel. That's right. That's right. And we do it every single day every day you grew up in some context whether it was even mormon jehovah's witness islam whatever you grew up in a context atheism don't believe that atheism is in a religion goodness gracious by the way i want you to know god doesn't believe in atheist okay just letting you know that Okay, two of you got that one. All right, great. <laughs> Every one of us. Some of you grew up very Asian. Talking to you Wongs, Fukumotos, Yamamuras. And you ask a Yamamura, is there anything wrong? And they go, no, everything's fine. <laughs> It's all good. And you walk away. Did you see that booger hanging out of his nose? Oh my goodness. You won't say any, cannot save, you gotta save face. Honor. I was taught the very first time I went to Japan, do not ask, does this train take you to Sendai? Because they will not want to dishonor you. And so they will say yes. <laughs> And you will end up in some other part of the world. <laughs> Ask a Japanese person, which train goes to Sendai? Ah, oh, so there's nay. Hi, and then they will take me all the way down to where I need to go. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Okay, so you've got that. Then you've got someone from the East Coast, Connecticut. And they're so in your face, you think they're rude. And you take an East Coast, Connecticut, New Yorker, Italian, forget about it. What do you do? Know? We bring all of this and say this is the right Christianity. Hmm. That's what's going on here. These Jewish legalistic Pharisees are bringing Jewish legalism. You see, Peter ate with these and then he even baptized them and they had not yet been circumcised. My point, put this in your notes, like most arguments, if the people in those arguments actually read the word of God from end to end, we would have no problem. If we actually knew what the word of God said, we would have no problem. For example, Isaiah 42, 6, I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations. Hey, Rabbi, what do you think the word nations means? He obviously used it plural for a reason. 
And so the whole point is that we see over and over and over what they were trying to say. So now Peter begins to recall the events because instead of being able to celebrate Jesus, he now has to talk to Christians about God rather than talk to non-Christians about God. Now notice with me at verse 4. He says this, But Peter began speaking to explain to them an orderly sequence, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying in a trance, and I saw a vision and a certain object coming down like a great sheet lowered in all four corners of the sky, and it came right down to me. And when I had fixed my gaze on it and I was observing it, I saw four-footed animals of the earth and the wild beasts and the crawling creatures of the birds of the air. And I also heard a voice saying to me, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing and holy or unclean has ever entered my mouth. Again, repeating the story. But a voice from heaven answered a second time, what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. And this happened how many times? Okay, just like we learned last time, this happened three times. I love it that Peter's even admitting it, that that seems to be his mantra there. This happened three times times. And this, excuse me, and everything was drawn back up into the sky. Verse 11, and behold, at that moment, three men appeared before the house which I was staying at, having to be sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, underline that church, and the Spirit told me to go with them without misgivings. And these six brethren, and I told you last week we didn't know the number, now we do, these six brethren also went with me, entered into the man's house. We all went in. And he reported to us how he had seen an angel standing in his house saying, Send to Joppa and have Simon, who is also called Peter, brought here. And he shall speak words to you by which you will be saved, you and all your household. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us. Now look at it. The Holy Spirit fell. What does it say, church? What's the word? Upon, circle it, upon them, just as he did what? Upon, circle, us at the very beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord and how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If God, therefore, gave to them the same gifts that he gave us also after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to say that I could stand in God's way? Amen? Amen? I mean, he tells this response, and the whole thing is, don't blame me. I'm just the servant. I'm just the obedient one. Let me tell you what God was doing. Look at this. First of all, verse 12. Go back there. It says, the Spirit told me to go. And would you circle without misgivings? The Spirit told me to go without misgivings. I'm going to tell you right now, he still does. He still does. He is going to come to you, he's going to come to me and say, go. And our whole answer is, it starts off with what word? Usually it doesn't start off the word yes. It starts off with the word but. But. I want you to go, um, but did you not say, but God, I don't do unholy things, but God, you said light and dark don't coexist, but God, and all of a sudden we start throwing our scripture and yet not understand that context plus content equals meaning. And so understanding that when God guides, God provides, when God calls, we go. Secondly, drop down to verse 14 as it says this, and he shall speak words to you. He himself, Peter was testifying that Cornelius was testifying, that the angel was testifying. I love this, that he will speak words to you by which you will be what? Saved you and your household, meaning these words were needed. What did we learn? That Cornelius, a God-fearing, praying, giving, generous, good father man, was still on his way to hell. So if being godly and righteous made you Christian, then this whole last three chapters is a muck. 
We are not saved by good works. We are saved for. for. And so here we see a man who God says, oh man, I want to reach you. And so he needed the message. And you know what? The world around us needs the message. Just as everyone around us needs to know something. And could we sit there and let someone drown? I spent time sitting in a chair, our whole job in that chair. Both Cindy and I were both lifeguards. The whole job was not to get a tan. The whole job was to keep your eyes and recognizing that people are in a vulnerable circumstance. They're in water and in over their heads. Think about it. I think that'll preach. And then verse 15, it says, then the Holy Spirit fell. The Holy Spirit fell. Does that mean he tripped? No. Look at verse 15. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us at the beginning. What does it mean when it says that Spirit fell? It's the epi. The power. And you shall receive power, epi, when the Spirit of God comes upon you. That's when he was using that dunamis, as at that point you're going to have the Spirit in you, the Spirit with you, and then upon you. And he cannot come upon you until he has come in you. And so this is what we see here. So he said, hey, who am I? Because if it's upon them, then I know that he's already in them. They've already believed. So then that is why Peter says, that is why Romans says, Paul says in Romans, that if you believe in your heart that Jesus is God and confess with your mouth that he is Lord, you shall be saved. saved. Am I connecting any dots here? So all of a sudden, we see where all of this new theology of um, not Judaism, which was about what laws you did or didn't keep, but Christianity about the law that he came and paid for, and that was the wages of sin is death. And I love this. At verse 16, they're giving him all this grief about everything, and he says this, I remembered the word of the Lord. I want you to put in your margin right there. You'll get out of a lot of trouble if you'll do that. You'll get out of a lot if you and I can just recall the word of the Lord. I love verse 16. All this is going on. He goes, and I remembered what he said. Now, people have said to me before, wow, you seem to quote a lot of scripture, especially when I'm teaching in the classes, and I'll do the apologetics, and I'll ask a question, and I'll answer this one. Then I'll say, yes, when Obadiah says this, and yes, Habakkuk says this, and over here, Malachi says this, and, you know, all these other different things. And the kids are like, wow, how do you know the scriptures so well? And I say two things. Number one, I don't do this. I probably have the weakest thumbs in the room. Never once in my life, and I'm 52, ever even held one of those units in my hand. It's ridiculous. Marriage is being destroyed because a guy wants to do this. But here's the magic in how you learn God's Word. You ready? You ready? Read it. <laughs> But in order to do that, you've got to do this. Click. <laughs> Miracle. No, we just want to get the book on tape. And I'll just jog and I'll listen to the scriptures. I'll clean the house and listen to the scriptures. It's great as an addendum, but if that's the core of your time in the Word, you're not going to remember squat. Verse 17, he said, if therefore, if God therefore, if God therefore gave to them the same gift, notice, not just the same gift, but as he gave to us also after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? Amen. Amen. 
I mean, he's saying right now, who's large and? Okay, God's large and in charge. He's making it real clear. This is it. So he's saying, hey, God is the one who is large and in charge. Hey, we could ask that question a little more, shouldn't we? We could say, hey, who am I to stand in God's way? But instead we say, well, you know, I don't see it. Well, you see, I don't get it. You know, I had somebody say to me, even just recently, even this, this evening, saying to me the fact that, hey, you know, this whole context of how the presidential elections happened, that happened by God. And so since God did that, then God's obviously going to deal with all the responses and everyone trying for a recall and all these other different things. Okay. Well, first of all, truly, God is large and in charge, but God has also given us the permissive will. And we've got an entire country of people who are sitting around not obeying God. And they're saying, I don't see it. They're not going, the Lord has spoken, so let it be written, so let it be done. No. I have a sovereign God, but I have a very sinful country. A very sinful world, because it's filled with very sinful hearts like yours and mine. Amen. Amen. And so we sit here, and we should try to remember saying, who am I? But instead, Lord, I don't understand it. And so if I don't understand it, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to step forth. You know, basically, we need to say, and I'm trying to share this in love, so what? So what? God has said something. So what? I don't understand it. So what? I don't see it. Can I just in love say, who are you? Who am I that God should explain his ways to me? That's what the psalmist said. I wanted to know, I wanted to know, and finally said, Lord, who am I that you should have to explain yourself to me? Job, for 35 chapters, is like saying, explain to me why I have boils and everything else like that. And then in chapter 37, God shows up and says, excuse me? Do you know where I keep the snow? Shut up. That's basically, that's translation. That's in the New Jersey version, okay? But there it is. It's like, boom. But we are so control freak. Tithing? Oh, I don't know. What does it say about the money? You know, is that Old Testament? Is that New Testament? Folks, it's serving the Lord. It's serving the Lord. Tithing is not how much of your money you give to God, but how much of God's money you keep. And the last thing in the world I want to be is seen as a horde against God. But we've got a whole other mindset. You know, Pastor, I heard a sermon, a whole sermon about how that's Old Covenant. Okay, then if you only want the old covenant to serve the Lord, then let them. But I'm going to join the new covenant serving the Lord and watch the blessing. Because you can't outgive God. And so he's just simple there. The whole thing. Let God be God. Verse 17, you can write that on the margin. Let God be God. Hey, he gave them gifts. Don't shoot the messenger. He touched the Italians. And who are you? Who am I to stand in the way of God? And verse 18, and when they heard this, they quieted down. He put it back in the context that it wasn't me, it was God. And they quieted down and glorified God saying, oh, well then. I think that there should be a little stuttering there, don't you? Well then. Well then. God has granted to the Gentiles also repentance that leads to life. And so they have this little epiphany. Now, first thing I want you to jot down is I like that it says, I heard, or when they heard, they quieted down. It means they kind of came to a conclusion of the obvious that's been in the scriptures all throughout the Old Testament. But look how sad verse 19 is. So then, you got the well then, and now the so then. Those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose in the connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word of God to no one except Jews alone. Now, look at me for a second, church. We've got one of two conclusions here tonight. We have to be careful on both because we weren't there. Amen? So I, it's not my job to judge. But you got two options. Either their hearts were hardened, and so like Jonah, who did not not hear God say go, Jonah didn't want to go because he didn't like those people. He was hoping the Ninevites would go to hell. So Jonah 
was a racist. And said, uh-uh, Ninevites are them dirty Arabs and I'm not going to have anything to do with them, so I'm just going to leave them alone. I don't want to go touch them. Blah, blah, blah. They're from the sea to Esau. Let them fry. And so God went and got them. So here it says, oh, I guess God's got Gentiles. But I only like hanging out with Jews. Because I don't like them smelly Gentiles. Somebody here tonight... It's not that you haven't heard that God loves everybody. It's not that you don't agree that God loves everybody. Question is, do we? The question is, can we? You see, what I see here is the absence of what I call compassion. And what is compassion? I spell it C-O-M-E. Passion that comes from God. When I have God's passion, God so loved the world that he gave. He gave not a weekend, not two hours. He gave his only son. And if I could just have that kind of compassion, that passion that comes from God, that does something that moves me out of my heaven, out of my comfort zone, and I left that dwelling so that I might be around those who need the gospel, those who might be very extremely annoying, but I can step out. And so my question to us today is this. Have we turned some family and our small small island here in Hawaii, have we turned some family into Gentiles? Oh yeah, you know, that's the Kanakas, uh, you know, we don't go over there because, you know, those guys, those are liars, uh, them guys. Oh, that's your, your in-laws, eh? Oh, don't talk to them, bro. Remember that one time we went to the house and I swear they stole the ladle, it was them. <laughs> we don't talk to them. You've turned them into Gentiles. You've turned these people, is there a people group? Maybe it's not a certain family that you don't talk to anymore on this island because you're all hoo-hoo and haboot about. But maybe a certain people group. Oh, we're more progressive. We're, we're, we're not racist anymore. Okay. Still get called a dang howly a lot, so I'm not so sure I agree with you. But um, could be millennials that you don't hang with because... You're an older and educated person. It could be you don't hang out with older and other educated people because you consider them old fuddy-duds. Who have you turned into a Gentile that you are not choosing to hang with? And thus we are just as guilty of dropping the ball of the gospel. Amen? Amen. It's right here. So the choice is here that they did this as a choice or they did it because they were too scared and forgot the power of the Holy Spirit was going to go with them anyways. Amen? Amen. It's one or the other. See, it's so sad that the very people who needed Jesus were not getting Jesus. God, forgive us because they are the ones that need the Lord just as we need the Lord. Doesn't the Lord teach us even in his prayer? He said, Father, forgive them as you have also forgiven us. And so, Lord, we ask for this prayer as you have forgiven me. Help me to forgive. Have we reminded this? Because if not, this is that whole backside of what it really means to be a Christian. And we leave people in the dark because of our fears or of our bias. In verse 20, but there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks, hallelujah, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord, hallelujah. And the news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. And that's what we're going to look at a whole lot more in our next message. But it says this, those who did share as with us who will step out of these doors today and share, it says the hand of the Lord was with them. And it says many got saved. Why? Because the hand of the Lord was with them. And I want to show you something really cool about the Word of God. Notice back there at verse 20, it says some of the men, men of Cyprus and what does it say? Cyrene, underline that. Let me give you a little fun biblical trail. This is what happens when you read the whole book. You start connecting dots. Does the word Cyrene sound familiar to anybody? Yeah. Huh? Okay, yeah. Simon. Okay, yeah. so you know, now, now you know that Cyrene isn't his last name. It's a place. But Simon had a son. What's his son's name? It, 
What'd you say? <laughs> Bar, you know, Bar Jonah, everything else in the Bible. Okay, no, no. Rufus. Rufus. Come on, I haven't heard, heard any parents, you know, I hear all these biblical names, you know, Joshua, Jonah, David. What's where, where's Rufus? <laughs> okay, check it out. Matthew 27, 32. And as they were coming out, Jesus is carrying his cross. He falls down. They found a man of Cyrene named Simon, who they presented into service to bear his cross. And so here we hear of this man who did this whole pilgrimage with his family just to go to the temple. And the moment he touches Jesus, he's now considered unclean. And his whole trip was a waste, a wash. It was purposeless. He no longer could celebrate Passover. Or could he? Or did he just? Then Matt, Mark 15, and they pressed into the service, pastors coming by from the country, Simon the Cyrene. And what does Mark want us to know? The father of Alexander and Rufus. So what does that tell us? He goes, they grab a guy, you know, Alexander and Rufus is pop. What does that tell me? That that man at that moment, at that hour, became the part of the church and his kids were already in the part of the New Testament church. Pretty cool, huh? So much so they needed to write and reminded the young people about the old people. Yeah, Simon, Simon. You know, Alexander, you know, Rufus, his pop. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That old guy that sits in the back and says amen all the time. Okay. <laughs> And now check this out, Romans 16, verse 13. Greet who? Rufus, a choice man in the Lord, and also his mother and mine. Wow, here we see this family being touched, and here we see it right here. Where? The people of Cyrene. This was happening, and that's why we see boom, 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 Jesus at the cross. Now the Holy Spirit, Gentiles being invited in. All of this is going on. This is the beauty that we see in this story, because people believed that with God, they can achieve anything. Amen? These men, verse 20 says, but there were some of them. Circle that, underline that, highlight that, whatever you need to do. But there was some of them. Oh, the church is doing this and the church is doing that. Okay, but God, can you say, oh, but in 2016, there was some of them. But Lord, in 2017, there were some of them who would give freely of their time, their talent, their treasures, that would step out of their comfort zones. But there were some of them who cared about the lost, the quote-unquote the Gentile, the quote-unquote unclean, and shared the gospel. And what happens? The hand of the Lord was with them. We close with these two verses here. Verse 23 says, Then when he had come and had witnessed the grace of God... He began to encourage them all with a resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. So Barnabas has now come down to Antioch. Barnabas, the man who's known as the encourager, he comes down and what does he do? He sees with his own eyes the grace of God. And what is the words out of his mouth? He says this, I encourage you with a resolute heart to remain what? True to the word of God. Put this in your notes. Number one, witness the grace of God. When he witnessed the grace of God, what did he do? He rejoiced. Perhaps some of you are, have been a real sticks in the muds, real fuddy duds, real boring, maybe needing to have video games all night where you play something fun or you blow something up, but you need something. And I'll tell you why, because there's the absence of joy. And why is there the absence of joy? Because you haven't recently witnessed the grace of God. Because they obviously did things before video games and television. He witnessed the grace of God and he rejoiced. And then what did he tell them to do? To be true to the Lord. That's so important. Not true to man. Not true to a church. Not true to the law. But be true to the Lord. And someone's going to say to me tonight, Yes, pastor, I want to do that. But how? How do we do that? Look. Look at the text. It says, with a resolute, or your version might say, a purposeful heart. 
not half-hearted, not double-minded. I told you several weeks ago, I said in this very service, some of you say, I want to quit smoking, and I said, no, you don't. I had a person come up to me and say, you know what? You're right. I've been saying for 10 years I want to quit smoking, but obviously for 10 years I've been lying to myself because I'm still smoking. Right now, praise God, they're 18 days straight. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Not because of it's a law, not because anybody, but they recognize, hey, my body's a temple. I got to take care of it. Just for the same reason that I shouldn't go, go home and have a bowl of Fruit Loops and a Snickers bar for dinner because Cindy's at the women's retreat. <laughs> We need to be mindful. Amen? Amen. <laughs> I wonder if the pizza deliveries went up this weekend. <laughs> Folks, Romans 10.10 10 says, For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness. Where's your heart today? Where's your heart? You know that a mind can change over a hundred times a day, but the heart, not so easy. The heart doesn't switch like the mind does. I got a case in point. Remember back in junior high, high school, or maybe even college, when you were so in love with that person that you know that didn't even know that you existed? And you knew without a shadow of doubt there is no way that you and them were ever going to be anything. And you knew that up here, but your heart still ached. And they would walk by and you go, oh, oh, Lord. <laughs> If only. The Bible says it's here that drives us. Hey, why did you quit football? Ah, my heart wasn't in it. Man, you used to fish all the time. Yeah, I don't know, just my heart wasn't in it. It's the same. And what does it say here? We close with this description of Barnabas who challenges them to be true to the Lord with a true heart. He says, they say of him, for he was a good man. Luke says Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. Wow. What a testimony. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith. And what happens when there's a good man, a good woman, a good Christian who was full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith? It says considerable numbers we're brought to the Lord. Amen? Amen? It makes me think of Jeremiah 29, 11, when he says he has plans for us, plans to prosper us, not to harm us, but to give us a future and a hope. And that is the promise that God has for us. But I'll tell you what, we can't get to that plan until we first come to the plan of salvation. We need to go to the Roman road before we try to go to the Damascus Road or we try to go to the Antioch Road, we need to make it to the Roman Road. The simple Roman Road right then and there. As it's written, there is none righteous, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God demonstrates His love for us that while we were still sinners, He died for us. Why? Because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess and are saved. And 10, 13, for whoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, but the issue with this truth today is the same as we saw with Peter. You're either dealing with love or legalism. Love or legalism. You're either looking at the side where it's a Jesus who says, I know you've messed up. That's why I called you to the table. Levi, I'm going to turn you into Matthew. Zacchaeus, get out of that tree. Come on down, brother. I know you. I know who you are. Simon, I'm going to go to your house tonight, you Pharisee, and I'm going to have dinner with you. Jesus knows exactly who we are, but we can then become the judgmental, 
the legalistic people and start saying, but God, you couldn't love me because I'm not faithful enough. I'm not consistent enough. I can't do this enough. I can't be saved. I continually fail. And every single time I agree with you and then I walk right out and do everything wrong. And, I, and so we're going to hold on to the legalist side. And so we're going to pick a fight with God, just like those guys who did with Peter when Peter says, who am I? I'm going to tell you right now, who are you to argue with the love of God today? Who are you to say that God can't love you, that God can't use you, and that God doesn't have a wonderful, amazing plan for your life? I love this picture because it says it all. One way. Jesus. Amen? Father, I look at a country in turmoil, a generation that is lost and confused, and I pray that we are not part of the problem by sending on messages in our social media of the ignorance and foolishness and the stupidity. Rather, Lord, let our hearts break. May we say, God, forgive us. Because this generation of believers is responsible for this generation of souls. And Lord, have we been faithful to the message? Have we cowered or have we been like Peter and the six and like Barnabas who will step across and minister to any Gentile? Because we too were once without Jesus. Increase our faith. Speak to our hearts, God. Lord, we need you. We need you, Lord. We need you. And take a moment and where is, did God speak? Where did God speak to you in this message? Where has God challenged you today? On your environment, in your heart. Why did God have to repeat this story twice for you? What does he want to make sure you don't miss? Thank you, Jesus. And if you are here today and it is time for you to surrender, I'm not asking if you want to invite Jesus into your life. That might have been the problem. You might have done that a month ago, 10 years ago, but what you did is you invited him into your life rather than you into his life. So you've still been calling the shots. But if Jesus is God, Jesus is God. So if today you want to ask God to forgive you of your sins and to be your Lord and Savior and you need to make that submission, would you do that right now? And in your heart and say, Jesus, today I need to come to you and ask you to forgive me of my sin. Please be my Lord, meaning you call me to do and I go without misgivings. Be my Lord and Savior. Please give me your Holy Spirit to come into my life that I might learn how to live like your child. Today I repent and come home. If you prayed that for the first time or the first time that you know it was sincere and you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you became a born-again child of God. But God said, confess me before men. I just showed you the scripture. If you confess with your mouth. So if you today have done that prayer, then I want to encourage you to raise your hand right now so we can celebrate with you as we're about to enter into worship. Is there anyone who said, today, Jesus, I want to be a child of God, born again, coming home first time? Anybody? Let us know if you did. Then church, 
Praise God that we know his name. But let's give him our lives. He gave us his. Amen? Amen. Hey, thank you for spending your time with us today at One Love Ministries and being a part of our program. But this invitation that you heard today through the Word of God is directly to you. And I want you to know if you have not yet made a profession of faith, meaning ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, that invitation is available to you right now. Change, transformation, all the glorious things that God wants to do are available to you, but you got to ask. You must personally invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. So if God has been speaking to you during this message, your heart's been beating, your hands been cutting kind of sweaty, you've been wrestling with things, guess what? That's the Lord knocking on your heart. And I want to lead you right now in a prayer that can allow you to invite Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior and open the door for eternity for you and Him to be together. I want you to pray with me right now. It's not a magic prayer, but an honest heart that will invite the Lord into your life. Join me right now. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I ask you to forgive me and to become my Lord and Savior. Today, Jesus, I believe that you are God and that you saved me and my faith will be put in you. Please give me your Holy Spirit to come in and upon me that I might learn how to live as a child of God. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. And today, I come home. In your name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with us, we are excited. The Bible says the angels in heaven are rejoicing and we want to join them too. So would you call this number right here on the bottom of the screen and let us know. We want to help you find a church that's in your area. Get plugged in, get fellowship, get disciple as the Bible says. Because we want to grow in God's grace together. God bless you. He loves you. We're excited. If you would like to receive a copy of today's message, please write down the sermon number on your screen and give us a call at 955-9335. For service times and locations, check us out on the web at onelove.org. Mahalo for watching.